We are live now, huh? Okay. Two seconds. Hope everybody's doing okay. Charlie's here. And uh, I thought Spencer was going to come. He might show up later. And I've invited a few other people to uh, come. It looks like it's just you and me right now, Charlie. But okay. uh, good to be here. You know, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see who else comes in. But I'll oh, get two people watching us. But um, for those of you that are not kind of following the internet, Right now, up in Chiang Mai, we're dealing with some terrible air. This is the worst. You know, the, the numbers are not that bad um, compared to other years. But the effect that this smoke is having on us now, and it's not, not just me, it's everybody. This stuff is really starting to make people sick. This is the first year that I've actually felt the smoke. You know, you go out and you can feel it in your throat, and you can feel it in your chest and your eyes. Guys are start burning, and, and this is the first year I've ever had that happen. So it's definitely, uh, definitely something's going on here. I don't know exactly what. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Appreciate you coming in. We got Chris here, Mark, and somebody else is in there too. That I can't identify them, but uh, you know. So that's what we're going to have to deal with until we get some some heavy rains. And how how's the smoke down there in Bangkok? It's it's. In the air has improved. Uh, I, I left for the Philippines, I guess it's uh, six weeks ago now uh, that, I, that I left, and um, a little over six weeks, and I was there for five weeks, and when I left, the air here was, was, was nasty, you know, and that's why I scheduled that trip to the Philippines during this period of time. You know, I've come to know, you know, mid-February to, to April, really, is the smoke season here in Bangkok, yeah. uh, or actually the beginning of February. Next year, I'm leaving early. And uh, uh, and I was pleased because I went to BGC Manila and I had no idea how it would be there. You know, this is a regional problem. It's not something that just happens in Thailand. Uh, yeah. You know, crop, crop burning goes on from, you know, the west coast of Africa to eastern Indonesia. And, you know, like four billion people set things on fire that they don't want anymore for several months a year. And it fills the entire region with smoke. It's a it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a it's a big problem. Uh, it, it's a bit, become particularly bad here in Thailand. Chiang Mai has always been like the worst. Yeah. You know, I think the way it's situated in the valley there, it just collects the smoke. And yeah, we're in a bowl water. here. Yeah, and uh, so it's improved. When I got back, uh, it was beautiful in BGC, by the way. It was very, very nice. I was, you know, the air wasn't without pollution. It's part of Metro Manila, so, you know, there is a little bit of a haze, but, uh, you know, just, in, you know, it's, it's something that you would expect in a big city. It wasn't particularly... You know, there were times when the wind was blowing. It was crystal clear days. It was very nice. Yeah. You could see the mountains off in the distance and stuff. And uh, so it was a good choice for me. And and within two days, I felt the difference. You know, the smoke here does get me down. You know, it's like yeah. you know, people live like this year after year. And I'm like, no, I'm done. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this time of year. I'm gonna leave for uh, four or five weeks at least. And uh, this, you know, I go back to the states to visit anyway. So I'll just schedule it around smoke season. So it has improved here. It's a, it's a lot better. It's not as nasty as it was. And, you know, as we get more into the rainy season, it will become, you know, better and better. And yeah. I, I hope that happens to you soon. Yeah. You know, we, we, had, we had two days of rain, about two days, two, rain two different nights. And then the next day it was, it was fairly clear. And that's when I, I snuck out and made a video. And actually, I did a bike ride, too. But by the next day, it was, you know, it was, it was right back to where it was. And, and, you know, I didn't really realize it until, uh, you know, I started noticing, you know, my chest was hurting. Uh, you know, my throat was hurting. My eyes were watering. I was like, oh, mighty, you know. So I, I went to the doctor. The doctor said, are you out in this stuff? And I said, yeah, you know, I've been riding my bike and, you know, just out doing my normal exercises and stuff. And uh, he says, you don't, don't, he said, you're better off not exercising and uh, staying in. So that's pretty much what I've been doing for the last three or four weeks, just kind of hibernating in the house here and uh, doing nothing. They don't live with it, but die with it. 10 million went with lung problems, yeah. Yeah, there, you know, last year when I, last year at this time, I was doing my chemo and I would have to go in and I'd have to enter in through the, um, Kind of like the, the emergency room area of of uh of Surapat. and uh it was always full and 
Right? And that's what it was. Hey, but hey, Greg, how you doing? <laughs> Everything going on? You enjoy your trip to Japan, I'll bet. Greg, American in Thailand. Just got back from Japan. I've been watching the video. It's really, really good. <clears throat> Fly down and see Charlie for cleaner air in Bangkok. Yeah, I'm going to. As soon as I uh as soon as I get all cleared up, though, I have that's gonna be my first first trip. And uh, hey, I loved your I loved your videos, Greg. They're great. I haven't watched the last one you put up yet. I haven't watched it yet, but I'm going to. He uh, I was amazed at how much money you spent over there. It was expensive. It was, it's not cheap. Charlie, have you ever been to Japan? No, no, it's not my list. It's uh I do want to visit there, but no, I haven't. They, yeah. Uh, yeah, he just went, and they had, from his videos, they uh, they really had a great time, did a lot of walking, and I was amazed at how much he spent for food. He spent a lot of money on food, and uh, there was one meal that he showed was basically a soup dish, and a few other things, I think the cost was about $60, but, you know, that's what happens when you travel. But, Sounds like know. New York. Yeah. How was, how was the food in the Philippines? I, BGC, which stands for Bonifacio Global City, is a little urban enclave that I, I later found is privately owned. It's owned by a corporate conglomerate headed by Ayala Corporation. Because, I, I was, like I said, I was there for five weeks, and it suited my purposes. I went there to practice yoga, and uh, <laughs> I, I was happy there. But it felt like a theme park. It was like, you know, it, it really was a bubble. You know, Metro Manila is not that nice. You know, it's, it's right. not terrible. It's improved a little bit from 10 years ago when I was there last, but it, it's still not the nicest urban area around Metro Manila. And uh, but BGC is it's it's, it's yeah. upscale. It's a, it's condos and, and office buildings and loads of Western style restaurants. So I had plenty of, uh, of food options available to me. So the food was good, you know, there. But food in the Philippines is not so good. <laughs> mm -hmm. they, they don't have the best diet in the world. And uh, uh, so if you're going to the Philippines and you're going to be eating local food, you know, prepared to eat rice and rice and <laughs> stuff with rice. <laughs> it's like, you know, you get the, you know, there are some local dishes. in the, you, you know, like when you travel around the world, did you ever see a Filipino restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for that. <laughs> so BGC is great. I mean, if you if you, that, you want to spend some time in Metro Manila, and uh, it's a, it's a little upscale. It's not cheap. I mean, you're paying Western prices there, so you have to have enough money to do that. Yeah. Uh, but it was a lovely place, and I'm going back actually. I'm going to go back for two weeks in, in mid-April. Uh, there's a very special kind of yoga that I do that that, that you do yeah. in a hot room, and. Um, you know, I went there to, to practice that and for five weeks, and and I got result, really great results. So I'm going to go back and do it again for another. Looks I'm like you're go having a great time. You know, I'm like like 74 fun. years old. I, did, I never believed that I could be in this, you know, good shape at yeah. my age. And and it, it's not only physically but mentally. It quiets mental chatter. It gives you clarity of mind. You know, I feel you know I feel like I took ten years off my life in the five weeks that I was there. You know, I got a little. A little chubby over, you know, after the plague, you know, like everybody else. <laughs> I got a little fat and a little, you know, lazy. Yeah. You know, it's, it, 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 at our age, you know, you, you downhill quickly, you know, and, and I found myself overweight and, you know, just not liking how I felt. So over the past, it's been a year now that I've been trying to get back to a decent level of condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, the five weeks that I spent practicing five days a week in BGC, uh, I really got results better than I expected. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I, I went in with the question, that, you know, can a guy my age actually uh, get back to a, a level of fitness that's that's uh, that's pretty good? And the answer is yeah. You know, and so yeah, I'm going back. I'm going back yeah. after three more weeks. So that was a long answer to a question. Yeah, there's good food in uh, in BGC, but the rest of the Philippines, uh, you know, you're not gonna. I don't think Anthony Bourdain ever went to the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never, I never did, never did see him go there. Really, now that you mention, yeah. it's like but, uh, yeah, the, the food sucks. It's a, <laughs> <it's right. laughs> well, those guys in Dumaguete don't don't look like they miss many meals, though. 
Well, that's the problem. I mean, you know, they do have food, but it, it, it's fatty, sugar laden stuff with, you know, white rice on everything. Everything is served with rice, you know, so it's fatty. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, the Philippines themselves, you know, it's the 30 years old, they start putting on weight. You know, you don't see a lot of skinny Filipinos. So it's not that they don't have food. It's just that the, the, the quality of the food isn't the best. You know, it's, it, it's processed. Remember Spam? Yeah. Yeah, let's love, love, love fried Spam. You like Spam? Yeah, with Spam, fried, to, with a spam couple of eggs. Was something my grandmother had. I mean, yeah. it was Spam was developed in World War II. It was canned meat. Anybody you right. know, that's sitting here thinking Spam, that's unwanted emails. No. Spam prior to <laughs> prior to the digital world was canned meat. Right. And and it was and developed God. pretty much in World War Two, you know, to feed mm-hmm. soldiers. You know, it's uh, rations basically, and it's salty ham basically, and uh, very salty and highly preserved. Well, it's a staple in the Philippines. You go to a restaurant, they serve spam and eggs, you know, and it's like, you know, they eat it as as a staple. You know, people are like, oh yeah, I love spam. You know, I'm like really, I haven't seen spam since I'm like twelve. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it since I've been here. But we used to fry it with eggs all the time. And, oh, yeah. Uh, that um, so yeah, that, that, but that's a good example of Philippine yeah. food is spam. No, pass, pass. <laughs> I watched your your last video, and you pretty much covered just about all the screwy screwy things that everybody's done here in the last two or three months. It's just amazing that uh, the stuff that's been going on. The, uh, the quality, it's, uh, actually, quality tourists we've been getting. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you know, it's a lot of people here. I don't know what it's like up there, but we have this on suddenly, uh, suddenly, over oh, the last you know, three months, you know, tourism has uh, come back full force. There's, yeah. uh, there's a lot of folks around here. It's funny, I was sitting, <laughs> I posted, I, I might have put it on Facebook too, but I was sitting in a restaurant, coffee club this morning, just having some coffee and a little something to eat, and there's two guys in the 40s, I guess, behind me, and they're German. Oh, your post, and they're having yeah. an animated conversation in German. And, like, and it's triggering all the, you know, I'm thinking of movies, you know, World War II movies, where all the Germans mm-hmm. are spies, you know. Like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's indicative of what's going on here. It's, it's like there's tons of tourists back. Um, there's a restaurant that I go to occasionally down in the Superwood area, Pala. Mm-hmm. A lot of expats are familiar with it. It's, it's basically a souped up pizzeria. I mean, it's, it, there's seating in the place, but it's at high tables on, you know, on high chairs. You know, it's, it's like not fancy. It's nice. I mean, it's nice mm-hmm. and clean and the service is very good. They, they train their What's the name of it? Pala. P-A. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You when I met, that's where we met the first time I came down. Pala that's pizza. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, they actually did well during the shutdowns. They, they hung in there and they've since expanded the place. But you go down there now at dinner time, they give you a queue number. I'm like, really? Yeah, it's wow. like you have to wait. To, you have to wait to get into the place. You know, mm. it's like this. This is, you know, not. You know, it's, it's a pizza. It's a fancy pizzeria. <laughs> it's yeah. a, they serve a lot of it. I shouldn't say that. They serve a lot of different Italian fare, and the, the, the food is very good. So yeah, uh, it is good. You know, I, I don't want to knock them, but uh, it, yeah, they they filled up the, uh, the the BTS is. Uh, you know, if you go in the wrong time, right there. Yeah, a lot of people you, on it. If you go, if you go about, I think about nine o'clock. It's two for one until they sell out. Everything that they've got there, they sell two for one. What is this? It's Pala Pizza. Oh, yeah? <laughs> when they, right before they get ready to close, they, they have price everything. In other words, if you buy one ah. piece of pizza, you get two pieces. And, uh, but, I, you know, to me, the best pizza is that one down off of uh, Vasio's or whatever it's called. Vesuvio. Vesuvio's, that's the best. As, it as is good. As can, as a, as yeah, Vesu- Vesuvio is very good. Last night I had a I hadn't had pizza in weeks, right? And I had a uh, an urge to have pizza last night, and I went to Wine Connection, which is another decent place. You can get these. Yeah, we got Wine there. Connection up here too. They, you know, pizza was, you know. Was... <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and I kept thinking I should have went to Vesuvio. I didn't want to go downtown anyway because it's crowded. It's a crowded pain in the neck to get there. I live, you know, like five stops away. But I, I you know, I should have went there. Pizza, pizza's worth the trip there. I had a, I, I, uh, I had to wait there once too. I went, and, you know, they were like, "No, oh, Phil, you know, you can go sit outside at the table." And, oh, okay, you know. So they're filling up too. There's a lot of tourists are are here, and you know, there's. Yeah. 
Uh, what does he say? We, I've been we, seeing a lot of criminal activity from Farang's bad idea. Yeah, it is a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's, it seems like it's getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, and I don't know why. You know, we're not having that much of a problem up here because people are bailing out up here. You, I, I drove up and I went up to Gecko today because I want I want to have some lunch in the city, and I didn't get into the moat because the moat is so messed up right now from them digging the holes to bury the cable. It's actually dangerous to drive up there around the moat right now, and I, I'm just not going to take a chance on, you know, falling in a hole. There was a motorcycle that fell in a hole um, two days ago, and two people on it. And there was a video of it. I wish I could play the clip on it, but they just fell in the hole. They kept, the bike went down in the hole, and they kept going, sliding across the road. And it was right out in front of Chankwood Gate. And so I don't go up there. But the, the traffic up there is, is people are bailing out. They're leaving. Uh, Gecko, who is usually busy during the day, that's the only one in there eating. I, he came, Rudy, the owner, came over and sat down. I said, where's all your customers? He said, they've all left because of the smoke. And, and a lot of people have left. And we're not getting that many, you know, that many tourists now because of the smoke and uh until they figure out something during this time of year it's you know they might as well just close the doors of the city because there's, there's just not yeah, anything it's, going on. it's not an easy problem to solve i mean you know it, it, you know if thailand took action to reduce the smoke in thailand mm -hmm. you know you still may get you know you could get the smoke from Myanmar and Cambodia and Laos and yeah. all the surrounding countries. You know, it's like it has to be a regional thing that 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 really addresses the problem. And it doesn't seem anybody has the, the uh, leadership skills or the political will to address it. I've been watching this. I landed in Singapore 14 years ago, and I remember Singapore, which is a very uh, uh, you know ecologically minded city. You know, they they. They do a very good job of uh, of, uh, of uh, taking care of their environment, but it's, it's you know it's a, it's a little island, and on one side you have Indonesia, you have Java, and and then Malaysia to the north, and it fills up with smoke, and the smoke down there is just as bad as Chiang Mai in this burning season because they get the mm -hmm. smoke from uh, I think it's Java, and it's palm palm oil. And somebody told told me when they burn those crops that they produce even more smoke than what you guys get up rice crops and stuff yeah so that covers singapore and it's it's nasty horrible and off the ground you know this is nasty stuff and i remember when i first encountered it this is in 2010 you know as i first first trip there and um there was outrage in the newspapers and online and you know, all the politicians oh well, you know and we're gonna it's corporate you know, burning and we're going to take care of this and we're going to do that and all this. i'm like oh well hey look they're taking action it'll probably get better and anybody I said that to that lived there just laughed at me. They're like, hey, they do that every year. <laughs> yeah, and that's I what don't... happens when it gets really bad, like it is now. The politicians that don't want to appear as if they're doing nothing, you know, take something, they'll arrest one farmer and they'll make a great big deal out of it on. on yeah, they've arrested two, two now, I think, so far. Right, right. So they'll, and, and that'll be plastered all over the, all, all yeah, over the sympathetic exactly. newspapers, like the Bangkok Post right. and. And you know Singapore Times and then what of Straight Times is the name of it in Singapore. You know they're they're government ass kisses and and they uh, and they plaster that stuff all over the place to uh, make it look like somebody's doing something. Yeah. And you know next year is the same thing all over again, rinse and repeat. Yeah. Well, you know I think what happens a lot of what happens is that once it goes away, everybody kind of forgets about it. And, you know that it's so pretty up here that. Uh, you know, everybody's, oh, you know, next year, it, <coughs> maybe it won't be so bad or, or, you know, whatever. But this year, even though it doesn't seem like the smoke was as bad as past years, the effects seem to be, be more. And, uh, and it's not just me. Like I said, I talked to other people that were, you know, choking and gagging. And uh, there was one guy that uh, I know slipped here a long time. He was actually popping up. You know, blood and stuff. You know, and stuff. So, you know, who knows? You know, we don't know what's going to happen, but I'd say next year it'll be the same. You know, it's just the way it is. Has um, been for the last fourteen. <laughs> it's been that way ever since I've been here, and it's not changing. You know, I moved away once, and uh, you know, it, it, there's nothing really any better than living here. So, I ended up back here, and you know, and that's just the way it goes. 
you need to educate farmers that it's better to mix. The, yeah. Yeah, and it really is better to mix it in with the soil. It's better, uh, better fertilizer. Yeah. And what that would require would, you know, he's right, uh, Mark, uh, that, that is correct. And they have to be educated and encouraged, you know, with, uh, you know, with uh, economic incentives and other, you know, political tricks that they do to change population uh, perspectives, because this is something that these farmers have been doing for centuries. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's what yeah, they know. Yeah, for years. Yeah. It's, it's what they, yeah, centuries. It's what they know, right? And it's the easiest way for them to get the job done. You know, it's just easy to go out and set this on fire, and then three days later they can, you know, start plowing whatever's on top and whatever. So yeah, there is there are alternatives that are probably better, you know, in the long run for the soil and for the crops, but it requires machinery to do it. So yeah. that would mean investment. You know, these poor farmers can't afford to go out and buy, you know, a, a, a hundred twenty thousand dollar tractor. But governments could supply one to villages. You know, everywhere yeah. there's a lot. You know, that's a temple for those, you know, they, they used to, the temples used to be the center of particular villages. So mm -hmm. I'm just using it as a kind of a reference, you know, go to particular okay. villages and put one, you know, expensive tractor in place and let everybody use it, you know, kind yeah. of a shared mm -hmm. thing and start, you know, start that way. Um, and Thailand is certainly in a position where they could do that, but, you mm -hmm. know, it's Myanmar, you know, they, yeah. they're, still, know. they're still shooting at each other up there and, you know, and it's, it's done all across the region here and it's, it's, uh, I'm glad I don't have to solve the problem. It's a big problem. I don't. I don't think it'll ever be solved. To be honest with you, I don't doubt, I doubt that it will. I think there are too many, too many little fingers and hands and stuff in the in the till that you know they can't they can't. They can talk about it, try to do the best they can, but I don't. I don't see. You know, I I think their best their best avenue at fighting it is is seeding the clouds. And, uh, you know, going at it that way, because usually when they do that, then we get rain for a few days and, you know, then it kind of stops out. But who knows? This, like I said, this year, it's 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 affected people. And uh, I had some friends that came came over from Tennessee and uh, they actually spent their Well, they were in Bangkok for quite a while. They spent a month in Bangkok and they came up here and spent a month. And uh, the air just it ran them off, it ran them back to back they left they went back down to uh bangkok when the air got real bad but uh you know it's just it's it's pitiful it's it's, it's it's hard to live that way you know i we've got all the windows closed we've not opened up the windows in ages i've got air purifier in, in every room running and my air quality now i'll go look see what it is in here i'm running double zero so it's clean. It's doing well, cleaning the air up. But this morning it was 33 in here when I first opened up the room and, and uh, got things going. I'm running the air conditioner up there that has also got a filter in it, so you know it kind of cleans the air out. But inside the house, it's not bad. It's when you go outside, it's when it gets you. And as far as the dust, go out and I got to wash off my car every morning. <laughs> you know, I've got about half an inch of dust on. Me. That's what we have to put up with. You know? I, but my solution, you know, I, I would uh, visit, go home to visit my family in the States twice a year, and which I've done up until recently. Yeah. Uh, but what I'm going to do now is going to go once a year, and uh, I'm going to combine that visit with uh, with other places I want to travel. As a matter of fact, I just started planning now. I was talking to my friend uh, Richard, who lives in London. And I want to go visit him, and uh, I want to visit Prague. As a matter of fact, I kind of deciding what I want to do uh, in Europe uh, next January, and I'll, I'll leave here probably, you know, second week in first second week in January, and I won't come back until mid March, maybe even April. Yeah, I don't blame you. you know, I'm, I'm going to visit Europe, meet some people there. That I'll visit my friend in London, and then I'll fly to New York and visit my family there, stay another two, three weeks, however you know long I choose, uh, and and. You know, that'll put me to the end of February, and then I'll probably go back to BGC and do it with you. It's like, I'm just going to leave during the smoke yeah. season. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's the easiest solution for me, but not everybody can do that. I mean, you know, it's, I'm, I'm in a fortunate position that, that I can do such a thing. You can float around. It's part, you know, it's part of life here. It's something we have to deal with, and you're really not, you know, other than leaving, like you said, there's not much you can do about it. 
you either have to put up with it or, you know, just uh, go through it. Mark says, I'm going to Massachusetts on the 31st of March. One year next time, too. Where, are you, where in Massachusetts are you going? Just out of curiosity, because I'm from up there. Uh, yeah, I've spent some time there myself. Yeah, you have too. Yeah, you had you had a uh, yoga studio there. Over there. I had two of them, one in uh, Northampton and the other in Amherst, which is in western Massachusetts. Yeah, I've been to Amherst University of uh, Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah, right there. yeah my, my brother graduated from there. The uh, that that whole area, Northampton, Amherst, uh, is is called the five colleges area. There's like. The, the Smith College, Amherst College, there's a bunch of, you know, schools there, big schools there, and uh, uh, it's known for that. So I lived there. I liked it there. It was a, it was a nice area. Well, we went. You know, I took Lex there in two thousand nine, and I hadn't been back in years and years and years and years. I mean, it probably been I think probably twenty years since I've been back there. It was nice. I mean, I took her to Worcester. We went to Worcester, and then we spent. Uh, about four days on Cape Cod and uh, in Hyannis. She had double lob twin lobsters, and we had all we ate seafood until we couldn't eat anymore. But the worst part about it was, we when we came back, I, I we flew into Boston. I rented a car, we drove to Worcester, and then we drove down to the Cape, and then we had to drive back to Boston, spend the night, and then catch our flight the next day. The hotels in Boston are just unbelievable. I mean, we rode around. I couldn't find one for less than three hundred dollars a night, and we ended up getting a hotel that was right on the interstate. And inside the room, they had earmuffs, so you couldn't hear the thing, couldn't hear the cars. We had no hot water. Oh, and it was three hundred bucks. I mean, it was just terrible. And I told my wife it was Holiday Inn Express. Oh, God, I'd never do that again. I shop at the Karat Chef. He makes pretty good cheesecake. And I'm bringing back graham crackers. Oh, there you go. You know, that's one thing I haven't seen here is graham crackers. Um, oh, tortilla chips. Yeah. Uh, my, yeah. I think we have tortilla chips here, but they're not like what we get in the U.S. Not even yeah. close. Of all the things I miss most are tortilla chips. There's no decent tortilla chips here. Now, do you eat the corn chips or the, uh, or the flour ones? Is that, that's what you're talking. What are you talking about? I, they, there was a brand here, Mission brand. I think uh, you can occasionally find, mm. you know, decent chips, but they're scarce. There yeah, are a few. Yeah. Re I've seen Mexican restaurants that have them. They must make their own. Yeah, I know yeah. the ones up here do. And, uh, yeah. Good morning from Petersburg, Canada. Oh. Peterborough. Peterborough, Canada. Never been there. I've been to uh, Nova Scotia and, and uh, where else? New Brunswick. And that's about it. Nope, it's all about the molasses. But uh, yeah, I don't know. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. You know, this year, next year, that's probably what Leck, what Leck and I will do. We'll start planning little trips. This year, I pretty much got to stay pretty close to my doctors, but I think by next year, I'll be able to venture out, you know, take trips here and there and stay gone for a couple of weeks at a time. And, uh, well, you're coming down here soon, aren't you? Yeah, probably sometime, probably sometime in June, whenever, you know, whenever she wants to go back to, to visit her family, then I'll probably come down and, and stay about three or four days and fool around and take up my spot at, at Hooters and and watch the the goings on. Peterburg is about an hour from Toronto. And Hooters. I wish I was sitting there for the Lady Boy riot. <laughs> that would have been fun. That is amazing. <laughs> I uh, that inspired my video. The video that I have. Up yeah, there. yeah. I saw. I saw. That pretty good. Video. A lot of people are watching it. But um, the uh, I, that's what I thought when I saw that. For those of you who may not know, I talk about a bunch of. Uh, uh, trans women from uh, from the Philippines got in like a riot uh, yeah. with, with trans women from Thailand. There was a Lady Boy riot, or, you know, thing. And it's like everything. It's all you know. People are taking videos of it. And, uh, yeah. There's some pretty funny videos there. It's like this, yeah, Lex is watching it, watching it live on TikTok. 
they're broadcasting. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty. Ah. It was pretty funny, and that's really what inspired the video. I just made a video about you know behaving badly in Thailand, and I, I started out with the story of that because I was in the Philippines when it happened, and yeah. I saw it on the news, you know, on, on the Philippine nightly news, and they were like, you know, so you know the Philippine what do they call them trans women? Philippine yeah. trans women were attacked. I, you know, they of course flipped it, but it was, you know, here it was the Filipinos doing the attacking in Philippines. It was the Thai girls doing the attacking. And, uh, you know, it gave me inspiration for a video. There were a lot of bad boys, you know, a lot, a lot of bad boys and bad lady boys around that week. It was like, you know, the uh, Swiss guy who kicked the doctor off his stair, stairs in Phuket and then the other dimwit punched the hell out of a lady up in the east side. And, oh, oh, yeah, and the Kiwi boys that disarmed the yeah. cop. <laughs> They're lucky to get a Great. Got a list of bad boys I could do clips about here. That's it. <laughs> well, the thing, the thing that struck me kind of funny was on the lady boy thing. Apparently from, and I'm going by what Lecky's told me because I've read a little bit. Apparently, there were a bunch of Filipino lady boys that were working Soy 11, or they were messing around Soy. They're staying on Soy 11, but they're out working. They ganged up on two Thai lady boys, and there was some kind of a ruckus or whatever. And then the, the other ones, and apparently all those lady boys were staying at one hotel on, on Soy 11. Well, the, the, the Thai lady boys got on their cell phones and, and called for reinforcements. <laughs> and that's what you saw in the street. Wartime communications. <laughs> I mean, this whole, this, this, you know, you've seen the video and I've seen it. Unbelievable, just madhouse. Just hundred had to be hundreds of them. And they're climbing over on top of each other trying to get at these Filipino girls because the, the cops were trying to get the Filipinos out of the hotel. Because they're afraid that the lady boy, the Thai lady boys, were going to be one to show them. And oh, what a mess it was! That's funny. Uh, I didn't know that. That's like you know, yeah, war yeah that's what that's what happened. Like that. And yeah, just started with with the ones that, that got beat up. They got on their cell phones and started calling their friends. And the next thing you know, they were calling their friends and their friends. And then, whoo, that's how that big crowd got. You know, you saw it. There had to have been at least three or four hundred people there. And you know, basically all lady boys. That I could see whether there was about 20 cops there trying to get, you know, get up into the hotel, and that was about it. Well, I'm just looking at this comment that you have up on the screen from Honestly Uninterested. Good morning from uh, Con Kanye. How would you say that? Con Kanye, Kanye, oh, yeah. New Brunswick, yeah, just know. outside of Moncton on the ocean. I'm guessing Canada. I don't even no. really know where that is. Yeah. <laughs> Well, New, Brunswick is in, New Brunswick is in Canada, so. There's a New Brunswick in Connecticut, too. I mean, it's like. Oh, is there? One New Brunswick. Oh, either one. New Brunswick, Connecticut. No, I, have never, I have never been to New Zealand. I don't know. Have you, you, you been to New Zealand? Somebody was just no. asking that. No, I didn't think so. No. no. We hadn't been there. Oh. But, Not uh, New Zealand. Now, here's a beautiful place. New Zealand has a reputation for being, you know, a gorgeous place to visit for its natural, natural beauty. Uh, the uh, I was uh, I wasn't completely uh, against the Kiwi boys that got in a fight with the cop until I talked to you, because uh, you know the, the the Phuket cops have such a reputation for shaking people down. I thought you know maybe the cop was the one who caused the problem. You know that's what's running through my mind. But you said that they ran a checkpoint and that changes from the, whole the way. Story. From this is this is how I, I read it through through the. Uh, different medias that I, I looked at. Apparently, these two guys rode through the checkpoint, which is out in front of the police station in Chalong or, or some down there, and this guy went after him, jumped in his pickup truck and went after him, which is something that they don't normally do. And I'm, I've seen people ride through the checkpoints here in Hangdong, and they just kind of wave at them when they go by. But from, from the way it was explained... He stopped him, got him stopped, and then got his phone out and was trying to take pictures of him because he thought they were going to take off again. And then they took his phone away, and then that's when all the shit kind of hit the fan and, and his gun got, got taken away from him. And his, actually, his gun went off during the, during the melee. It's wonderful. Somebody didn't get shot. Uh, 
know, there's really no no excuse for it. You know, it, it, I think it'll. The thing that kind of struck me kind of funny was, and I heard it on the on the uh, the video that I watched. He one of the Kiwi guys is talking to um, the person in this video and said, "We thought he was going to try to kill us," and they were saying that about the cop, but. You know, who knows? I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what transcribed. I think something. You know, I think it'll all come out. Hey, Dan. Hey, I appreciate it. I'm. I'm glad you enjoy the walks. Hopefully, if this air clears up, I'll. Uh, I'll start walking again. But I'm not going to try to do any more until, until we get at least a, a good solid week of clean air. It's just not worth it. But uh, so I don't. You know, I don't know what's going to come out of that. Those guys had that happen in the United States. My department, one of us, somebody would have got shot. I guarantee it. You, know, you don't, you don't take a cop's gun and, and and not get shot or get hurt real bad, beat up pretty good. So. One of the Those things that I like observed about the, the the police here in in Bangkok, that's mostly where I see them, you know, or online looking at videos and stuff, is the uh, the Bangkok police are capable of an amazing uh display of restraint yeah they, I've, they, that know, I've seen i've seen videos of them with with violent drunk people you know and they just kind of surround them and step back and confine yep. them and you know try to uh reduce the uh you know the confrontation which is typically thai you know they, they yeah. they're not confrontational people i mean everybody has their limits you know um the uh you know, like in New York, that would be a mortal sin for a cop to lose his gun to somebody. You know, it's like, yeah. now clearly they weren't, you know, these two Kiwi boys were not, you know, hardened criminals. You know, the, the you know, he's holding the gun out of the palm of the hand like this. He's not, you know, not looking to, to, to use it for anything. You know, so maybe they did feel like they were threatened. You know, I don't want to second guess anybody here, but, uh, <coughs> they're, you know, they're, they're, not, you know, they're, they're yeah. from a well-to-do upper middle class family. They're, you know. So they, they might something will come out. Something will come out about it. Yeah, you know, it's like they, they, they you know, they'll, they'll be booted out of the country though. No doubt, you know, once yeah. whatever time they do spend in jail, then they'll be asked to leave. I'll, I'll, I would imagine. But I'm thinking, you know, coming from a civil service family, I and mean, I was a fireman, but my father was a cop, my son-in-law was a cop. I was, around, you know, I still did. I have nephews that are still in a New, New York City Police Department. And you, you know, you're my buddy, you yeah. know, my buddy Bill in Chiang Mai, he's a retired uh, police officer or sheriff. I don't know, you had a lot of titles. <laughs> That's a detective. <laughs> but it's, it's like everything. the, uh, you know, I know from my association with the police types that if they got that gun, you know, taken away from them, from some perpetrator, they would never live it down. They would hear that for the rest oh, of their career. Oh, it would be horrible. Aren't you the guy to get the gun? You know, like that, that would be a, a mortal sin. <laughs> well, I, 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 and I told it in the video, and somebody sent me a message about whether it's a magazine or a clip or hell. I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not a gun freak or anything like that. I, I never, never was a gun fanatic or anything like that. I didn't, didn't have a big collection, but I had guns. And, and I was saying in the video, when I first started working on the road, and I was basically assigned to the interstate. And I would ride the interstate, look for road smugglers going back and forth. And I was the only one out there, you know, it's the middle of the night. And uh, at the time, I was carrying a 5906 Smith & Wesson, which is a, I think it's 5906, it could be a 659, I'm one of those two. But anyway, it was, it was a, a Stainless steel, nine millimeter automatic pistol that held 16 rounds. But the, the neat thing about this gun was if you pop the clip out, and all you had to do was just press the little button on the clip. And if it came out just, I mean, just a fraction, the gun wouldn't fire. You could do everything you want to do with it. You could take it out unless you hit, hit that clip back in the gun would fire. So if, if I was out and I had three or four people standing on the side of the road and I had to turn my back to them and get inside the car, I would always pop the clip out. Because I had I had a safety holster where you know you had to twist and turn and whatever to get your gun out. But 
you know, there was always ways to get it out, but I always had that. I always popped that, but I always carried a 25 automatic pistol on my ankle. And that was always ready to go. And I figured, you know, if somebody ever pulls my gun out, they can have that gun. By the time they, they figure out they got to put the clip in, I'm going to shoot them. And that was my plan. Never had, never had anybody come up behind me, never felt anybody sneaking up behind me. Um, never had to use that that little trick, but that's what I used to do. And, uh, most of these yeah, guys used to do the same those thing. Kiwi boys are lucky that uh, he didn't have Sumtri, another gun. Sergeant Sumtri didn't have yeah. that plan. Had problem. that happened in the, in the States, I guarantee that the officer would have had another gun on him somewhere, yeah. and those, those boys would have been shot dead. That, that one. Just, like I said, my, just, my son-in-law is, uh, well, he's retired now, and I'm retired NYPD, and he was a real gunslinger. He shot his glove compartment once. <laughs> and, I, and I still break his balls about it. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, like I said, you know, it's the kind of thing you never let him forget. He was going yeah. to the range. Apparently, they had to qualify, I don't know, annually, you know, periodically, they had to go to the range and qualify with the pistol. And uh, at this point, he had a desk job. He wasn't even doing real cop work yeah. anymore, yeah. right? You know, although he did do it for like 18 years, but... Uh, the uh, uh, you know he was uh, he was taking care of cars in a parking lot somewhere, <laughs> you know. But he had to go qualify, right? So he drove down there. He drove from he, he was off to he drove down, and I guess he kept his pistol in the parking lot on the drive there. And when he was getting it, we discharged accidentally somehow. I never did get all the details for that. Oh. You know that's the joke whenever you know gunslinger cop stories come up in my son-in-law's house. I was like, oh yeah, didn't you shoot your engine block? <laughs> We had, we had all kinds of things. We we had a we had a guy in, in, we had a a our offices this was probably back in the early early nineties, our offices were in a, a brick building downtown away from the sheriff's department. And we had had one supervisor that always felt like he had to be, you know, on top of everything. Well he decided he was gonna start having gun inspectors close to and he wasn't the chief. He was, he was under the chief, above me. But every uh, once a week, we'd have we'd have gun inspection, and everybody had to pull out their you know unload their guns, and he'd look down the barrel with a damn white cloth and shit. And we were all standing outside one day, out on the back steps, <laughs> and uh, smoking while we're waiting for, for the gun inspection. Because we'd always do it outside the parking lot. And we hear, wham, we hear a gun go off inside the building. And we go running in there, and, and it was a real narrow hallway. We had this one detective, his name, his name was, was Bob, and a big guy, just a huge guy. And he was standing there with his gun in his hand. Now he could see with this big cloud of smoke, and the smoke lifts in it. And there he is, and the bullet actually went through the chief's office out the window, and we don't have nowhere near where the bullet left. But uh, that was the last day we had gun inspections in that office. Oh, we ripped him. You know, we we just for, for years he got he got he got tickled about that. But what he had done is he cleared his gun and then shoved the clip back in, and he had pulled the trigger at the same time and boom off the gun. That's uh, that's one of the stories. And another time. Another friend of mine, I wasn't there, but I heard about it. He had a Tech 9, which is a, one of those automatic pistols. And he was on stakeout in the middle of the woods up, out in the county. And uh, they were watching some guy's house. And he just, he was out there playing with his gun and hell, it went off and it just tore the hell out of his dad. The dash was guard through the windshield and everything. He, uh, he got a few days off for that. You know, guns are something that you don't play with, especially if you, you know, even if you know about them, they're not shit like that can happen. It's a wonder there aren't more people, cops killed with their own guns than than, uh, than there are. We had, I had one one detective that shot himself in the foot and he he had kept, he kept his 38 uh, in an ankle holster and he was getting dressed for work one night and he stuck it in the holster and his hand like went off and shot, shot him in the ankle. He ended up in the hospital and yeah, he went back to work. We didn't rip him too bad. Yeah, it's just crap like that happens. Guns aren't anything to play with. Uh, I don't know. You just don't want that crap to happen. 
these guys are just lucky they didn't get hurt. You know, they're they, you know they're gonna they're gonna pay a stiff fine. I guarantee that, and they might get some jail time, and they'll probably get blacklisted. And I'd say that will happen to the other. I think that's going to happen to this to the two Swiss guys. You know, the one that kicked the, the doctor in the back. Um, I would venture to say that he's probably going to get get booted out and blackball blacklisted. And then the other guy that. You know, the, the ironic thing about the guy in Eson that beat up the, 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 the 60-year-old woman was they arrested him and set his bond, and his ex-wife was going to make his bond. It was only like 50000 bucks, and he turned it down. So he ended up, you know, going to jail. So I don't know what will happen to him. And, you know, the bad thing about the media is it's one of the big, my biggest pitfalls of the media here in Thailand is we'll hear about these stories, but when they – when they when they're finished, when they're disposed of, we never hear what happens. Have you noticed that here, Charlie? Have you noticed? I don't follow the media that carefully yeah. to make assessments about it. You know, I'll read a story and then forget about it. Actually, yeah. what I said in my video, all the information I had in my video, I got from you. <laughs> 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 Whatever you said about it in your video is what I repeated. So I hope you got it right. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, but you, you never you never hear about it. It's just like the, there was a guy here that uh, lived in somewhere I forgot someplace not far pretty far from here, and he 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 was from the United States and he murdered his wife, pregnant wife. And then he came here to hang down. They caught him and hanged down and arrested him. And we have never heard what happened to him. He's, you know, he's, he's in the prison system, but we've never heard whether he got 10 years, whether he got eight years, or nine years, 10 years, whatever. And nobody ever follows up on it. So, you know, we never actually hear what, what happened. So a lot of the stories that, that we tell, we don't have endings to. Yeah, I know. You talk about that in your videos all the time. Yeah. But, but... Just you know, back home, they follow the case from the from the beginning to the end, you know. And, but here they don't do it. They get <coughs> yeah, and then they make a history about it. It's like oh, yeah. collection of history on that. Oh, hey, here's Spencer. Oh, thank you. But, uh, Is that Spencer retired? Then? Yeah, that's Spencer. I don't know. He, he's got the link to get in if he wants in. He may be yeah. be off. He may be out somewhere. I, that he couldn't get on because he. He sent me a message that he, could, he didn't think he was going to be able to get on. But anyway. Uh, yeah, thank you, Will Spence. I actually bought some decent glasses so I could read these little bubbles that pop up. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, Lord. You know, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens. And, you know, the bad part about all this, all these things that are going on right now is now they're telling the police and immigration to start cracking down and you know i think we're going to feel a little bit of it i don't know how much of it but um you know i think we're going to we're going to start seeing a little bit more scrutiny on who comes in and who doesn't come in which doesn't really bother me i mean you know I, i've seen people get in here that have criminal records that shouldn't be here you know based on on what the law is and i don't know how they're getting in but um, I don't know, but you know the funny thing about it. Hmm? When what? I was in in the Philippines uh, last month, or a few weeks ago, um, I overstayed. You know, I was staying longer. They give you thirty days when you arrive. The, right. I guess visa on arrival. I don't know what they call it, but you, they give you thirty day. Uh, uh, permission to stay in the country uh, when you arrive. And I even tried to do it at the airport. They were very nice, actually. Uh, there were many things in Manila that have improved since I've been there last. The last time I was there was 10 years ago. And um, the uh, one of them was the air airport. You know, I flew into a, a relatively new terminal. Uh, there was uh, almost no wait and no queue going to immigration. And the young guy that took care of me was very helpful and friendly. You know, I said, listen, I, I, I'm planning to stay for five weeks. Uh, can you give me that one week extension? He says, no, I can't. He goes, I can only give you 30 days. He goes, but if you're staying in BGC, there's an office right there. And it turned out it was very easy. It was a very simple thing to do. Um, and the uh, I think the whole affair took like 45 minutes. You know, here in, in Thailand, you hear immigration. It's like, oh, there goes the whole day, right? Yeah. Um, there it was 45 minutes. And... Uh, to get this extension and uh 
part of it was uh, there, there were two tiers. You could get the cheaper one, uh, you come back in three days, or if you pay more, I mean, it was about double. I forget the price. It wasn't it was about $60, I guess, for the for the expensive one. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll do it in uh, 45 minutes. Like, okay. Yeah. So I gave them the money. I come back 45 minutes later, and they gave me the sheet of paper. I'm so glad I hung on to it. It, it was a, uh, a report for the, uh, uh, you know, they did a search to see if I, you know, you know, I'm calling it the bad boy database. I don't know what they call it. Yeah. But they checked their computerized systems to see if I was, you know, if I, if I flagged anything there, if I was amongst the bad boys, you know, and that's the purpose of the, uh, of the extension. Now, when I was reading the paper that I filled out, I think you can get up to three months. It might have even been six. You can get more. The shortest one is you can get a one-month extension, which is what I got. I only needed a week, but I got the one-month mm -hmm. extension. It's the only thing available for me. And then beyond that, there were a couple other levels. There was a re at least three months. There may have been more than that. I don't recall. Uh, but that was the purpose of it, is this, this printout. And when I was getting ready to leave the Philippines, you know, they're, they're, they're so uh, administrative oriented there. Any way you go is like three receipts for everything, right? You know, and I, I, I just stick them in my pocket and throw them on a table when I get home, that kind of thing. So as I'm preparing to leave, I'm throwing out all of these papers and I get to that one that was a printout. And my intuition said, ah, save it. You never know. So I stuck it in with my passport and they wanted it. That's how they... When you're exiting the country, when they see that you've overstayed the way that you proved that you have that is giving them that paper. Apparently, mm -hmm. they don't stamp the passport. And I never checked it. So I'm glad that so anybody that goes there and gets an extension, hang on to the paper that they give you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the moral of that story. You know? But they do have a bad boy list that they check. Mm. Did, did, they, did they take a picture of you for facial recognition? Do they have that? Yeah. Yeah, it was actually the immigration process was all very smooth, uh, which is not my recollection of it from 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, the, the, the young guy at the airport was very polite and friendly, and he called me when I go to get the extension. And the extension, like I said, was very, it was in a big new office building, and it was easy, no problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. It says, did you hear about the deputy that shot at an acorn? Florida deputy mistaken... A falling acorn striking his vehicle with the sound of a gun. Oh, that is funny. I haven't read that one yet. Yeah, there was a That's video of it. I think maybe he had his his, uh, his personal video thing on when it happened. Yeah. I, I, I kind of recall seeing a video around that story. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen it yet. I have to look. That's mm -hmm. funny. So an acorn hit his car and he thought somebody was shooting at him. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Glad it wasn't a coconut. He would have. He would have got out the rifle. Yeah, he got out, got, out, got out of cannon or something. Good <laughs> Lord, that's funny. You know, I, I'll tell you, I worked with a lot of good cops, and I worked with a few that were probably questionable how they got hired. But you know, it's it's uh, it's there's some crazy stuff. Hello, amigo. Hello, amigo. Ola, yeah, that's Lick. Ola Amigo. It's funny, when she was in the United States, they all thought she was Mexican. And the people that she worked with, worked with uh, would say, say, Ola, Ola, Ola. And she, she didn't understand what they were saying, but they thought she was a Mexican. So now she, she's always talking Ola Amigo. He called, the guy called for backup, too? That's interesting. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you, we had a guy, and, and it's, it's really, it's kind of a bit of a story. He worked the interstate, and uh, he, he he was basically drug interdiction, and he'd been working the interstate for probably about two years, and, and he, uh, I don't, I don't know whether he just wanted off the internet, on interstate or whatever, but he, uh, he gets on the radio one night, he says somebody's shooting at him through his car, he parked the rest area. Well, it turned out he'd shot his own car up and uh, just amazing. And he went on to get a job. We fired him. And he went on to get a job at OSHA. And, uh, you know, just crazy stuff. It, uh, no idea why he did it. It just didn't, no reason behind it. He wasn't going to get any money out of it or anything like that. He put about four rounds through the front of his car with a pistol that he had taken off of somebody and called it in that they were shooting at him and 
It's crazy stuff. Well, you know, an educated guy too. I don't know why he did it. It's just crazy stuff. Anyway, as a retired guy, I want you two guys to know you're living the life most of us wish we could have. Well, you know, anybody can have it. You just got to plan for it. I was uh, I was talking to somebody about that. It's like I've had a good life. I'm I'm a fortunate individual. I've had uh, yeah, you know, I've had a lot of good things happen, and you know, I guess you know, I've done some stuff right myself, but I've had a, I've had a lot of good luck as well. And um, you know, the last fifteen years have been the best of my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like seventy four years old. Yes, I, I came here. I came to Asia when I was sixty. And I came on a four-month work contract. I, uh, I retired from the New York City Fire Department uh, in 2002. And uh, I was in the yoga business for, I guess, eight years, right? And uh, I, uh, I saw my yoga studios in Massachusetts. And uh, a woman in that business that, that had a big, fancy yoga spa in Singapore, she had just opened it up, invited me to come and teach for her. And uh, I had met her at... at gatherings of that community of people. At the time, the, the style of yoga I did had 600 studios around the world. And um, the uh, so I knew a lot of people. I still know a lot of people in that business. And uh, I, I uh, said, right, let me give it a try. Singapore, I thought it was a city in China. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like a lot of Americans. I had done a lot of international travel, other than Jamaica, Mexico, Canada. You know, that was an international trip for, for a lot of Americans, right? The, uh, and uh, so here I am, 12 time zones away in Singapore. And I didn't really like it at first, but uh, by the end of my four-month contract, I was like, I didn't want to leave, you know. And 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 I did. I flew back to the states, and uh, I was like, I want to go back. So I arranged, you know, I arranged to do that, and I wound up working in Singapore for four years. Um, and I've had a good life. I don't want to say, well, this has been the best of my life because everything's up before that. That's not true. I had a very good life up to that, but this last, you know, this last 14 years has been the best of my life. So, uh, so yeah, Dan, I, you know, we are lucky. We're very fortunate and plan and, you know, do it. It's, uh, it's, you know, getting it, stay fit. You know, that's the big thing. You got to stay fit. Stay active and stay fit. Yeah. And you know, that, that'll, uh, you know, you get rid of your bad habits when you're young and start, you know, installing good ones like, uh, you know, eating well and exercising. And, you know, it, it, this is the most enjoyable part of my life. You know, to, to me, <laughs> exercise is, is, the, uh, is the key to it. You know, keep, keep, keep exercising, keep moving. Uh, you know, one of the good things, is, you know, I don't, I don't drink and I know you don't drink either. Uh, you know, you know. You, you try to keep as healthy as you can. You know, I think if I had been in, in, in bad shape, and drank a lot, didn't exercise, I may not have made it through this last little episode that I had. But uh, I was just fortunate that I, I was fairly, fairly strong when it hit me, and uh, I caught it pretty quick. So, you know, that's, that's a big thing. You know, stay active and keep moving and don't let any dust, dust grow on your butt. That's well, you look good now, Bill. I, 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 I think feel good. Gonna... I really do. This is the best that I've felt since, uh, well, since probably before the surgery, and, and I feel like I'm strong. Uh, yeah, it's good to see. You know, um, I rode my bike the other day, and, and absolutely no, no problems at all. I walked six and a half kilometers the day before that. You know, I feel okay. My blood work is all okay. Everything looks okay. So, hopefully, you know, after this last little incident with the you know the, the reaction to the immune therapy that's you know that's going to be the end of it hope oh. hey we're probably getting close to the end of the the hour here but there's, there's uh we are. Know, speaking of re- speaking of retirement one of the things that uh uh that's going through my mind right now like i said earlier uh, tonight i you know the smoke season is when i want to go around visiting right you know and uh, do my tr- trips to different places right so i'm already starting to plan what's going to happen next you know january of 25 and mm-hmm. um I'm, I'm thinking about becoming homeless <laughs> yeah. you know i was thinking you know like if i leave here for three months arranging you know for utilities and all that i'm like you know renting places like i do now is easy here you know it's like yeah. why don't i just you know 
I, and that, actually, just before I plugged in to you know come on to this uh, to this live podcast was uh, was when I started thinking about that. Now all of a sudden, that, that's an idea in my head. I don't know if I'll actually do that, but it's like if I leave here for three months, maybe it might be better for me to find storage for little stuff that I do have that I want to keep, and uh, and and just you know hit the road and you know, stay where I stay for that three-month period. Yeah. And then when I come back, you know, find another place. You know, it's, it's easy to do yeah. that here in Bangkok. I know there's a lot of cities in the world where the real estate market is such that that would be a pain in the neck to do. But here, there, you know, there's way more apartment space than there are renters. So, you know, it's easy. And uh, so I'm thinking I, that I'm, you know, I, I'll have to consider – next time we do a podcast, I'll let you know what I've decided. But I was just thinking of that because I want to go to Prague. Um, mm -hmm. I want to visit some of the yoga people that I know, right? You know, that are still in business around the world. And one of them is a woman in Prague who's just an amazing woman, Teresa. She's a uh, uh, she's a former ballerina, and uh, I, I I've known her for many many years. And um, she actually hung on. And business was so hard for her to hang on during the during the lockdowns and stuff. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that I knew in that business did go out, and she yeah. hung in there. And and uh, and she's she, she's an you know an amazing. Uh, athlete and dancer she was a ballet dancer and, and uh so i want to go visit her in Prague. and i want to see Prague. Prague's supposed to be a really cool place and i was thinking after that i'm going to london which is my next stop to visit my friend richard and um i said well where can i visit you know because there are trains all over europe and i think maybe i can take trains instead of flying from Prague to london maybe i could take trains and visit other places so as i'm hatching this as this scheme is unfolding in my brain i'm thinking why don't I just dump this apartment, store my stuff? I'm sure there got to be storage places at back. Yeah, there is. Yeah, you know, and and uh, and uh, you know, go homeless for three months. <laughs> you go. Know, like, that might might be fun. You know, the wandering. You know, so that's the kind of stuff you can do if you stay fit and yeah. plan for your retirement. You know, you could be purposely homeless. <laughs> there you go. Oh. Well, listen, we've been on for an hour. I appreciate everybody that came in. Charlie, I appreciate you coming in, and uh, we'll do this again. I, I know this is, we put this one up on kind of short notice. And I'll try to try to put them up a little bit sooner than uh, give you a little bit of time to plan and, and uh, you know, try to get them up, get the advertisement up for it at least five days in advance. And, but anyway, have a great day, and I'll uh, see you all later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah,